Welcome to this special edition of The Point of View. Tonight we're talking to economist and statesman, Mr. Kwame Pienim. It's been a very interesting time for not just Ghana, but the world. We are in the third week of the year, 2021, and the president has started putting his new government together. And of course, parliament has also started with its sittings after Speaker Bagbin was elected. Very interesting coincidence between Ghana and the US. And as we do this recording today, the United States will swear in Joseph Biden as their 46th president. We'll be talking to Mr. Kwame Pienim on his reflections on Ghana's democracy, keeping our fourth republic intact, the challenge this new government faces in stabilizing the economy, and keeping our union intact to borrow an Americanism. Mr. Kwame Pienim, great to have you. Good, good day. My pleasure. Nice to see you again, Bernard. It's good to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and I hope you are keeping safe and well. Yes, please. As you can see, I'm firmly ma masked up. <laughs> Very good. We are told there's nothing new under the sun. But even for somebody like you, uh, who's been, <laughs> I mean, you are over 80, January 6th must have been interesting. Watching our parliament try to agree on closing the old one and the new one, and then keeping an eye on the U.S. where angry people stormed <laughs> their capital. I mean, what has the past few weeks been like for you, just looking at the way the whole <laughs> world global system and uh, democracy has been put to the test. I think liberal democracy mm. everywhere in the world seem to be on the siege. Mm. Uh, I remember when President Obama came to Africa and he was asking us to build strong institutions mm -hmm. and not strong men. And I was a bit unhappy with that because the U.S. has shown that even with strong institutions, you get a president like uh, Trump, who is a bully, who doesn't believe in the democratic culture, and he can bully all the institutions. Mm. And I think that it is helpful to Ghana that we have to decide that we need to build the democratic culture of tolerance, give and take, and of adversarial relationship, mm -hmm. not enmity. And it was demonstrated, as you said, on uh, January 6th, uh, when our people, at least, we it was athletics, <laughs> our parliamentarians and fisticuffs running, and there it was more dangerous. There were weapons involved. Uh, so we have to be very careful, and the Americans are hitting the ground running. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should hit the ground running. We don't have time. 2021 is going to be a very difficult year mm. for countries such as ours. And we need to give support to whoever emerges as the executive president. We have an executive president, see in Ghana, not a parliamentary democracy. Mm -hmm. And some of the issues going around parliament, we have to be careful and creative, innovative in finding ways of the executive living together with a parliament that may be a majority, even on the side of the uh, opposing uh, party in mm. government. Our country is about 63 years old, yeah. and the Fourth Republic is about 28 years old. Yeah. When people see what happened in the U.S. and the fact that uh, somebody like Mr. Trump could become president, yeah. and the fact that people stormed the capital, yeah. they are saying we should be a bit gentle on ourselves because our journey is a bit shorter. Do you buy that view or you feel if the U.S. with over 300 years can face such stormy times, yeah. we should rather be more careful? What's your comment? No, I, I don't think so. Look, all of us, we're in the same universities with the people who are around America, Europe, everywhere. And we're not at the bottom of the class. You know, when you are younger, you run faster. Mm -hmm. It took Japan a little longer to become industrialized. It took Korea and Taiwan and those a shorter time to become China, 1978, they were having problems. The agriculture was miserable. Between 1978 and now, they've grown to become the second largest economy in the world, and soon, in five years, are maybe the largest, and they become a global superpower mm. going into the moon. Look, we don't have time to waste. We have young people coming, the youth are more, by 2050, there will be young, more young people in Africa. Either we have jobs for them that are creative and pay them well and they are here, adding value to our natural resources and become a force for building the nation, 
or they are unemployed mm. and now free senior high school. They are educated thieves and mobsters on the street destabilizing our economy. We don't have time. We have to run. Mm. The UK, they can afford. Their per capita income is what? Some of them $30,000. We, 3000 And we say we have time. We don't have time. Don't have time. Look at our streets. We haven't even started cleaning up our streets. COVID has revealed the most important thing, clean drinking water. Mm. Do we have it for everybody? Yeah. Food. Sufficiency. Mm. So, no, I don't buy that. We should run. We should show that we have accepted democracy. It wasn't given to us. We are building and that we can run it better. We'll come back to the democracy question. But on the economy, what is the scale of the challenge facing both the global economy and the Ghanaian economy? Some people think we should compare our post-COVID efforts to even the post-World Wars in terms of a type of Marshall Plan, in terms of the seriousness with which we have to rebuild. Is it that dire? Or what, what's your assessment of the global economic challenge and Ghana's place in that? You know, there, there, there's a lot of disruption going on. Mm. Uh, people have learned that uh, the global supply chain that was built, mm -hmm. that it doesn't work well because uh, you know that when you want uh, PPEs, you have to buy it from another country and they need it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And when the Chinese were not supplying the chemicals for India, uh, to do some of the pharmaceutical drugs. There was a shortage everywhere. So people are now trying to bring the outsourced industries in. They are trying to insource them or bringing them close to home. Mm -hmm. For us in Ghana, as has been said, it's an opportunity. You know, Washington Post, 23rd uh, December, mm -hmm. did an article on Ghana, how the COVID has presented opportunities for us to become self-reliant. They have this... Uh, uh, 1647 textile uh, factory that they uh, showcased where she are converted to building to uh, making masks mm -hmm. instead of importing them doing PPEs and now the military uh, clothes were being outsourced uh, to where to be able to sew together so we were trying to come to stand on our own feet and this idea of uh, textile the homeware that Alan Chomatin uh, popularized as uh, Minister in Kufo's regime and is doing it now. It means textile. Our women wear textile. Cotton. Cotton is supposed to be the base for about an 800 billion garment industry. A lot of the cotton is grown along the west coast. Mm -hmm. And we all, we export them to Thailand, to Turkey, uh, to China and so forth. If we were to grow our own cotton, you know, spin it, that's how spin test, the name came, because we were going to spin it there. Spin it, and then make it into fiber. Every Ghanaian woman, that's what they wear. Our soldiers, our police, that, our school, going to school, the children going to school, that's what they wear. This becomes an industry that builds up the economy, because to grow an economy means you minimize as much as possible the spin of that go outside. So when I pay you, and you spend your money on Ghana food and the farmers are producing. We are doing very well, we are growing. If I pay you and you go and buy soup and uh, king food made from Taiwan, Thailand, you are exporting your brother-in-law's job, okay? So this is a disruption that has come about. It's also an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And people are saying that Ghana should try to seize this opportunity. And the uh, government program that was launched uh, media last year mm -hmm. uh, called Ghana Cares, mm -hmm. you know, COVID-19 alleviation and revitalization uh, for enterprises support. So we're going to give support to our industries to alleviate the challenges of uh, COVID-19, mm -hmm. stimulate agriculture, uh, planting for jobs and so, which was one of the yeah. best policies that have been put together. So this Ghana cares. We should help Nana. If the court case finishes, he declared uh, president. They are no longer, but they still run. He's still the one who has been declared. So he's running as our constitution says. Mm -hmm. we, he should, should hit the ground running. And investing 100 billion was the idea. And that 100 billion Ghana cities. 
30 billion was supposed to be raised by ourselves and the 70 billion we attract investors to come in. Mm -hmm. The 30 billion can be funded easily. Okay. It's not a problem. Mm. If you take it, it's about even three years, I mean 10 billion uh, a year. I mean, if you take a change as five to uh, one, that's two billion uh, dollars per uh, two billion dollars per year for the three years that is left. The first half year was stabilizing the economy. That's about 3.3 percent of GDP. So even if we don't have the money, and we keep a deficit at five, and we had a 3.3, but a deficit of eight nine percent. In Europe, they call it quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. We can run a deficit of 8% and finance uh, this uh, Ghana Cares uh, program. What I don't like about it is calling Obatampa. You know, uh, we, sh we should move away from this concentric uh, way of uh, looking at things. So the idea is great, probably a few tricks of the name. But I'm surprised you're saying you can even run a deficit of 8% because deficits have been demonized quite badly. Of course, we know that in dire situations, even the German finance minister yeah. says, I don't want to hear about deficits. Yeah. A recovery that assumes a deficit of around 8% for a few years, yeah. will that not throw the fundamentals out of the water? Look, not necessarily. You see, a lot of this money is going to uh, import substitution, mm -hmm. rice. Mm -hmm. If we really put the money into irrigation for water and then uh, fertilizers, uh, high yielding inputs for rice, and we substitute for the uh, uh, rice that we import, mm -hmm. tomatoes, the tomato paste that we import, meat, poultry is coming from uh, uh, Brazil. So it is estimated that 70% of what we consume in Ghana is being imported. So if you pump this deficit we are talking about. If you go to grow maize, three months, the maize is in the market to absorb the money you pumped in. Mm. You know, inflationary financing can be done with finesse in the areas that you need uh, to go into so that the output comes to absorb the money that we are talking about. I'm saying if the worst come to the worst, I mean the uh, two three, uh, trillion dollar uh, program that Biden is putting in. Where is it coming from? One of the lessons from COVID is that it's a complete makeover of government involvement in, uh, in, uh, in the economy. Mm -hmm. They used to say it's the role of government to govern and that of business to do business. No, now you see that two, they go together. All the things we are benefiting from, mm -hmm. space, the US space program did research, it passed to the private sector, and then they run it. No, I think governments have to be uh, active and we have to uh, tell ourselves, how can we do this, manage it uh, properly? But, 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 I know because of your work with the UN finance ministry, you understand finance more than most people. What Biden has going for him, the surplus and the reserves, in fact, I heard some American economists say Biden can even print money, jack up the yeah. numbers. Nothing is going to happen to the U.S. economy. They are the world's richest country. Yeah. But when an African country like Ghana decides to even suggest printing money, all hell breaks loose. It's part of this just the perception about the way our economies are supposed to work. And how would you advise whoever becomes finance minister to go about balancing this import substitution expenditure with a realistic deficit, and even if it's possible, QE, yeah. in a yeah. way that doesn't let all hell break loose. No, what I'm saying is that mm -hmm. if the worst come to the worst, you can do some deficit uh, financing. Mm -hmm. But it means reallocating resources, mm -hmm. okay? Education is important. To have mm -hmm. an educated uh, workforce as uh, uh, productivity, makes mm -hmm. the economy very productive. But we need to cut all the waste. You know, if you have too many ministers, they all need cars, too many regions. You need a regional minister, a deputy regional minister, a secretariat sit there. We have to rethink now, what is the economic unit? Mm. Where we start from? Because now we are building from the top. We don't have an infrastructure. If it is the district, then we have to make sure that the district we have 
are economically viable. Mm -hmm. And the districts will then make sure that this is where the action is. And that's why when we take uh, one district, one factory, it makes sense. If you have the production taking place, the young people don't have to leave their communities to come to Accra for a job. There will be an industrial job for it. You grow the rice, you are milling it there. You grow cotton, you are joining it there. You want to process cocoa, you are doing it there. So a lot of the districts will then have what it takes. For me, one district, one factory is a vision which means ministers make sure that every district is equipped with the infrastructure to be able to host a factory. It means when a young Ghanaian leaves London or the US and come to Ghana and is from Isinimpong mm -hmm. near my village, he can go there and stay there and work in a factory there. Go there's a school he can send his children to. But if there are no school to send their children, he won't go there. If there's no water, he won't go there. If there's no running electricity, he will not go there. Mm. So the infrastructure will then be disseminated around and then we move there. So what I'm saying is that let's take a look at this very dynamic vision of spending 100 billion Ghana cities the next three years with government contributing 30 billion. The 30 billion, if you take it as a 3% of GDP, we should be able to get the money somewhere. What I'm saying is that the resources that were available to us in 2020 may not no longer be there for us. Mm. You know, the West, they are buying uh, vaccine, they are vaccinating our people. We need our president to be supported, to be in place already. Already, our minister for foreign affairs should be known, our minister for health should be known, our minister for local government should be known, and they should be negotiating with WHO and the advanced country to say, you said you help us with vaccination. Let's put you to the test. Every vaccine that you order and are delivered to 10% should be shipped to African Union for their members. That is how we make democratic this idea of fighting the COVID. Because what COVID has shown is that it is irrespective of where you are. If you cure it in America and Ghana is not, a Ghanaian sit on the plane, brings it, you, you have COVID there. If an American businessman comes here and goes there, you have COVID there. Your embassy personnel. So we need to make sure that everywhere in the world is taken care of. But we don't have time to be moving around and not putting our government in place. Look at what the Biden administration mm. had done before they start. You know, today, by dinner time there, they will have put in executive orders to reverse some of the policies they don't want, and their team will be in place, hitting the ground running. Very interesting. We are talking to Mr. Kwame Pienim, who is an economist, reflections on many issues. Let's just quickly deal with the finance issue. Is Mr. Ken Ophirata the right person for this next four years for finance ministry? Background is, we know the difficulties he faced. Financial sector reform, we've commented on this, we don't want to go back there. Issues around some of the deals they wanted to pass and how that led to a backlash from voters. If you look within the MPP as the party of Kwame Pienim, Don Kofo, Georgie Kufo, and all these great economic minds, should he be looking beyond Ken Oforiata? What, what are your thoughts? Look, I think that this is uh, the point that I'm going to make. You know, ministers in an executive presidency, ministers are advisors to the president. The chief executive of this country is the president. Mm -hmm. I think we should all uh, uh, be humble enough. You know, what this lesson, this uh, election taught us is that politicians should be less arrogant and be more listening and listen creatively. Let us give the president the prerogative, the right, to appoint whomever he wants to be his minister and advisor. Don't let us interfere. The president needs to leave a legacy. He has four years. The four years started 7th of January. He doesn't have time. He should have hit the ground uh, running. So whomever the president put there, all men like me will sit back and support. Mm. People forget. I was 32. 
when I was a principal secretary, acting principal in the Ministry of Finance, I said about 40 when I was running Cocoa Board. Jage Mensah, the best minister for finance we've ever had, was 40s, in his 40s. So don't let them think that these people are too young. The thing is that you have to listen. A minister is not supposed to do everything. You have advisors, the civil service, they give you advice. You have consultants, they give you advice, and then you move. Mm. So what, one of the things I wanted us to discuss is parliament. Mm. Parliament's job is to monitor mm. the executive, to legislate for them. So when parliament is there, parliament should not arrogate to them, especially in this uncharted waters that we are. Parliament should not arrogate to themselves that we are going to determine who becomes minister. You know, 50%, not less than 50% have to come from our side. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, NDC has almost the same seats. Mm -hmm. We don't want parliamentarians to be lobbying to influence the president's vote because they also want to become uh, ministers. So let's appeal to the new environment now. The governing party is the party of the party that are the executive, of the governing party, okay? Whether you call them minority, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Logically, whoever is the non-governing party chairs the public accounts committee. Why? For purposes of monitoring the government. If you try to insert NDC, the NDC, that is the non-governing party, that's the one that doesn't have the executive, if you try to insert them as chairman of committees, what is the role of a chairman of a committee in parliament? Mm. To be able to liaise closely with the minister, this bill you are bringing, what does it mean? What are you trying to achieve? What can we do? If you are in the opposition, how can you come and do that? So let's make sure that the opposition, mm. the two parties understand, because it will happen next time, it may be NDC as the governing uh, party because they want the executive, but they're in the minority in parliament. Does it mean that they are going to chair the committees and get the public accounts committee being chaired by the government? So these are uncharted waters and we want them to think innovatively and creatively about it. The president, the legacy goes to the president. Nobody will remember who were ministers. They remember who was the president. So if the president doesn't want to leave a legacy and he brings his nephews and uh, tribesmen to become all the ministers. Let's vote for him. It is his legacy. But parliament has a right to question them in the presence of the Ghanaian public, whether they are morally not fit, professionally not competent for the push they are going to be given. That's what we want, for mm. that to come out, to show people and then the president may change. What do you make of the fact that Mr. Alban Bagwin, right honorable, is the, the speaker? We know his experience. We know his NDC. Yeah. What, what does that mean? We, I, I don't know if you've seen such a situation in Ghana before. No, it's uncharted waters. Mm. And I think that, uh, I personally think that uh, there should have been uh, some negotiations since the things were too close mm -hmm. to see how we manage uh, that one. You know, it's interesting. People forget the speaker is the third gentleman of the realm. Mm. If the president and the vice president are out of the country, he becomes the acting president. Are we seriously saying that an NDC will chair a cabinet meeting of the NPP when the president and vice president are not there? You know, all these things should have been reflected upon. The political scientists should have held back to say, how do we resolve this uh, problem? But I think that uh, I know Bagman. And I think that if it's prevailed upon to say that, look, you are a Ghanaian first, NDC, you NPP second. Do what is right for the country and guide uh, parliament. You know, guiding parliament is not easy, like shepherding, you know, but you see what happened in parliament. We all need discipline to support him to be able uh, to do that. But I think that we are in charter waters. depend more on him or the president. During the inauguration, yeah. the president made statements which appeared conciliatory to say he knows Mr. Babin very well. Yeah. Whose onus is it to get this parliament led by an NDC man and an executive to work in a way that would be nationally beneficial? I think that uh, I've always felt that it is the responsibility 
or President Nana Kufuado to reach out to President John uh, Dramani Mahama for the two of them engage back channel what can we do for this country because look it is the survival mm. of the fourth republic that is at stake mm. if things don't go well we don't create jobs for the young people policies get onto the streets mpp ndc we are no more we are wiped off and then this country will set back another 20 years like what happened when we had the revolution the Rawlings Revolution, mm. you know. And we all know that revolution don't solve problems. <laughs> you know, they don't solve corruption, you know. And now that parliament is almost 50-50, that's what parliament is then in this realm. Parliament is supposed to vet every economic program that is presented to them, every contra international contract to vet it to see that it's the national interest. So that the arrogance of... Uh, the executive, whether you like a Japan or not, we are pushing it through, will not happen. They will say no, then the government will have to go and rethink, consult parliament again. How can we remove this for the national interest? I think this is what this election has taught us. And coming from the US and all the liberal democracies with the social media, we need also already to start thinking seriously. What are our institutions? the Media Commission, the National Communication Authority, the Ghana Association of Journalists and Broadcasters. What is their input to make sure that the airwaves do not become megaphones for disrupting good governance? You know, the politics of insults and so should be out. And discipline will then return. How closely are you following the election petition? When, since you mentioned the president and former president Mahama working back door, it seems that horse has already bolted because the, the acrimony is there. You can feel it in the, even the commentary in the court. I don't know how closely you are following that. And whether with, even within the fact that there's a court case, there's still space for that type of conciliatory statesmanship whilst the case still goes through the normal process. It is really sad if two former presidents, that's what we are looking at. Nanado, five years, President John Raman, five years. If these two people who saw an oath before to protect and advance the interest of Ghanaians cannot put whatever personal things they have aside and work for the interest of Ghanaians, then we are lost. Mm. I mean, it's just a matter reaching over. So let's sit down over a glass of tea. Because if they don't reach over, Bakbin is not an individual, it's part of an institution. So you have to get uh, the top talking. If you can't talk publicly because you are afraid of your supporters, talk quietly behind, and then once that is done, then it will permeate to everybody. Then the courts will know that what Ghanaian people, including both President Mahama and President Nekufu are looking for is justice, mm. fairness. That's what we are looking for. But I think that the onus is on the president because it is on his watch. Whatever happens will be on his watch. And we need to create an area of quiet and peace. Mm for the political processes to go on, for justice to prevail. I mean, people who were shot uh, and the election-related violence, there should be proper investigation by the police. And if the people were wrongly dealt with, compensated. I mean, when people know that justice is coming, it creates a pathway to peace. Mm. You can't get peace when there's no justice. What is your comment about the state of the MPP as a party, particularly in view of the rising voices of radicalism. Now, I'm asking this because, if, yes, the president leads the party, John Mama leads the NDC, but there are growing voices of people, some of them are executive position holders, some of them are on the media, and the rhetoric is very divisive and very party first. So how do you, how do you manage that arrangement? You see, the people who are 
shouting, insulting people, thinking they are macho men for the party. They are doing eye service to please the powers that be. If they knew that those things don't please the powers that be, they would shut up. Mm. I mean, the airwaves, people who are running radio stations in Ghana now, don't realize the troubles people have to go through to free the airwaves. Rekumbrobe was being chased all around uh, Ghana to establish his independent radio. And that's what led to the liberalization of the airwaves. People now take it for granted and they are abusing the powers of the airwaves. I think that if the airwaves people do not allow these uh, so-called serial callers who are coming to insult people, it won't work. No. And we should be in a position where the National Communication Authority, the Media Commission, will monitor the airwaves and those who are insulting people. I mean, uh, the Kennedy uh, Japan incident it was quite bad. And I'm happy that my nephew, Kennedy Japan, Honorable Kennedy Japan, had the good sense to come back and apologize. But those things should not be on. The radio station person should have cut it off immediately. And I think that the Ghana Journalists and Broadcasters Association, government is not supposed to interfere in uh, whatever you do. But I think they should, you should set standards that every radio station, every newspaper should have a qualified journalist to be an editor. What does that mean? Whatever standard you set, it means that that person should know what is libel, what is sedition, and be able to call people off. So if you do, if I have money, I can set up a pharmacy store. I need a pharmacist to run it. The same should apply. Okay. But the journalist should lead mm. and do that. And if they are not doing that, the National Communication Authority can then monitor the radio station and withdraw their license. Let's end with expectations on the economy again. Prior to 2020 elections, we had free water, some free electricity, some business support for people. Now, this was because of COVID. So expectations have been raised for the Ghanaian populace. We also know that post-election, you, you have to sort things out. Question to you, how do you manage the expectation of people who have just gone through an election and have been given some freebies with the reality of trying to steady a ship that has been badly hit by a, a virus? How do you manage that heightened expectation for more free things with what practically at least for the next couple of years, has to happen. We need very strong leadership. Um, I was a bit uncomfortable when in the State of the Nation address, the president didn't address the issue that 2021 was going to be difficult. And we have to manage our budget very tightly. The important things, water, clean water, accessibility to people, Maybe we should now start making sure the water is there, not just giving water free here. Let those who can afford water, electricity, pay for it. Our problem is that electricity is not in the villages, where the factories will be, where we want the young people to stay and work. Uh, so it's a matter of just being very careful, managing the limited resources that we have. We know the commitment for free senior high school, uh, we need to take a look at the uh, universities, the private universities, how we help them finance so that they are there because they provide a lot of capacity uh, for people. Uh, and then the few things that we need to revitalize the economy. How do we support the small, medium enterprises who create the jobs for the people? But first and foremost, the COVID is still raging. So people's health is important. Livelihood food, agriculture. Let the Minister for Agriculture continue his uh, uh, growing for jobs, reeling for livestock and so forth, import substitution. But first and foremost, let's get our government to entangle with WHO, the, uh, the development partners, to make sure we have vaccines 
to vaccinate Ghanaians so that we are strong enough to shift to, uh, you know, what Nana wants to not only revitalize the economy, but to transform it mm. into a manufacturing country. And this we need to focus on. All Ghanaians on board. Mm. So we cannot afford this. We are coming, we are yet me, you know, you step on my toe. The, the national interest okay. should be paramount. How have you managed to keep healthy? I see your mask. You are over 80. You look pretty strong. I'm 82. Every morning, <laughs> cold or not, I try to swim. Okay. That's one of the few things I learned from Achimode School. So swimming is one? Yeah. And a lot of fees and fresh I do my exercise, I swim, I read a lot. Okay. That's good advice. Hopefully. And eat properly. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kwame Pionim. We're speaking to economist Mr. Kwame Pionim on his reflections on a number of important issues, the state of the global economy, state of liberal democracies, not least the US and that of Ghana, the challenge this government faces in the next four years, how to manage the issues in parliament and steering the ship of state in view of the election petition. And we did all that here on The Point of View. Thank you for watching. My name is Ben Adavle. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.